Welcome to Praise Assembly Church Ministries, a community church focused on family, individual growth, and most importantly, the Word of God. We are here to share the love of Jesus Christ, encourage kingdom living, and equip you with the tools you will need to live the abundant life God has promised. Today you will hear an uplifting word from God shared by our pastor, Dr. Johnny L. York. It is our prayer that you will receive a personal message from the Lord today. Thank you for tuning in. Now, let's join our service. As we customarily do, I'd like to take a moment of time to review <clears throat> our intent and purpose and goal as it relates to this series we're currently on entitled Cycles in Life. The intent of this series is to accept the reality, for us to accept the reality, that life consists of a series of cycles. You cannot get around it. Everything in life, about life, is cycles. The purpose of this series <clears throat> is for us to understand that in order to be conformed into the image of Christ Jesus, we must experience cycles of difficult and joyous times. We must experience cycles of pain and happiness, as well as blessings and conflict. That's a part of our lives. And the goal is to identify the root cause of some cycles that we experience and ask God for grace to make alterations within ourselves that would glorify him so that we can live the life that God desires us to live. But today we're speaking from how to win unexpected cycles, winning over them, how to walk in victory when unexpected cycles occur in our lives. Cycles can bring with them the unexpected things into our lives. When we are just flowing in the good things of God and the blessings of God and life is so easy, we need to be alert to this one fact, and that is unexpected things can and oftentimes do occur in our lives along with the good things. They sometimes seem to be there at the same time. And we need to, to be, as we look at this now, we need to look at un the unexpected and realize what is there for. Unexpected cycles are there as nothing more than distractions. And these distractions are, are, are released by the enemy to get us off focus. And he knows that if he can get us off focus, we will not fulfill the plan that God has for our lives. So Jesus makes some, some interesting statements here in Matthew, the 13th chapter. We've read in our foundation verses. He, he simply says, this is the way, these are the characteristics of the kingdom of God. This is, how, this is what happens when you're in the kingdom of God. Be alert to this, what's going to go on. I'm gonna, he says, I'm going to share with you and tell you what I'm talking about. He says now, a, a, a man sowed good seed in his field. He, he, he's doing what's right. He's doing good. And, and where he sowed the seed is good ground. But when men slept, an enemy came in, he says, and sowed tares among the wheat. And the enemy went away. Now, it's some interesting thing about tares, but watch this now. But when the blade was sprung and brought forth, then appeared the tares also. In other words, the tear was like a weed. When, it, when, when the tear and wheat first began to grow, they looked the same. You couldn't tell the difference between them. They, they, they both sprung up and they both were green and they looked, the, the, a tear is a type of wheat, wild wheat. And so when they first came up, it was, it was good. And many times in life, we experience cycles, and, and some of, we're in a good cycle, but sometimes, somewhere, something unusual, unexpected happens, and we look at that thing, but it doesn't look bad, and it looks a little bit like God, it, it smells a little bit like God, it walks a little bit like God, it talks a little bit like God, but how can we tell the difference? Here are some of the characteristics of life. But the Bible says when the wheat sprung up and it was about time for harvest, then the tear, it said, and then it appeared, that word appeared to me, the tear became evident. 
when it's close time for harvest, you can tell what is of God and what is not of God. This is how the kingdom works, and this is how unexpected cycles begin to occur in our lives. And, 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 and so, so the, the farmers, the men that, that, that worked for the man said, shall we pull up the tares that we see? He said, oh, no, 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 don't pull them up now. Because if you pull the tares up now, you're going to pull wheat up also. Leave it alone. Because the time will come, God will begin to pull it out. And he said, look what he says, and the tear, when, when, when it's time for harvest, I'll get rid of the, God will get rid of the tear first so he can save the wheat. This, these are characteristics of unexpected cycles in the kingdom of God. This is where we're going and what we'll be talking about today. King Solomon makes a very important statement in Ecclesiastes chapter 3, verse 1. He says this, to everything, every sight, everything, there is a season. There is a time to every purpose under the heaven. To everything, there's a season, there's a cycle, there's a time. He says that to everything, not, not, not only in the earth is there a time and a season and a cycle, but also in the church. There's a season and a cycle and a timing for everything. What we need to do as believers is we need the wisdom of God to help us maneuver through the cycles and the unexpected cycles. We need God's wisdom. And James tells us that if any man lacks wisdom, let him ask of God. And, and God will give it to him. But he goes on and says, let him ask in faith. And he, and he, and he continues to say that, that if you don't act, ask in faith, you're asking with a double mind. And a double-minded man gets nothing from God. And so, so we're having to deal with and understand unexpected cycles that occur in our lives. However, because God allowed in the book of Matthew the tear to grow with the wheat, that tells me that God is sovereign over everything. He's sovereign. But when we don't recognize the sovereignty of God in every cycle we encounter, we are oftentimes will leave God's guidance and try to figure it out on our own. And any time we leave God's guidance and try to figure things out on our own, that means we have sinned against the sovereignty of God. And when we sin against the sovereignty of God, we become authors then of our own distress. We become prophets of our own destiny. We're doing it our way. Because what we need to do in any cycle is learn to walk by faith. The book of Romans tells us in Romans chapter 14 that anything that's not of faith is sin. How many of us have been operating out of faith and thinking we're doing what God wants to do, but we're actually operating in sin according to the Bible? But there was one we're going to use as an example to begin with here. A man by the patriarch by the name of Abram as he was first called in the Bible, Genesis chapter 12. Abram learned to obey God. He trusted God. And here's so much we need to learn from him because God does something with cycles even in his life. Abram learned to trust God, and he learned how important it was for him to trust the God he could not see. God tells Abram in Genesis chapter 1, I mean, Genesis chapter 12, verses 1 through 3. Now the Lord had said unto Abram, Get thee out of thy country, and from thy kindred, and from thy father's house, unto a land that I will show thee. Interesting here. Abram, get away from your family. Abram, stop depending on your daddy. Abram, move away from your cousins your favorite cousin. 
and I want you to go to a land. It's interesting that God never told him where the land was. Never told him what the land was. You go to a land and I will show you where the land is as you start going. Aren't those some, some directions? Most of us wouldn't walk in faith because most of us need, listen, where are you going? I don't want to know where you're going. If you take a different route home, where are you going? Why are you going this way? We need to learn how to trust God. So Abram didn't have, didn't have a GPS. He didn't have an atlas. He did not have Google to, to do a Google search. He did not even have MapQuest, Map.com, MapQuest. He didn't have any of those things. All he had was a, a word from God. Leave and go. And if you leave and go, God says, I will make thee a great nation. I will bless thee. And I'll make your name great. And you will be a blessing. I will bless them that bless you and curse them that curse you. Boy, that, that's a promise that many of us would love to see in existence today. If we can make that real, man, we'd be all right, wouldn't we? We'd say, God, I'm ready to go home. I'm ready to go home. You curse them because they curse the Lord. I want to see it. And in thee shall all the families of the earth be blessed. Abram left everything that was familiar and comfortable to him. God broke a familiar circle or cycle in Abram's life. God was telling Abram, and he was telling us today, in order to be used by God, you've got to forsake everything that's familiar. Because you will learn to depend upon that cycle. And as long as you depend upon a familiar cycle, you'll never walk in what God wants you to walk in. Wow. So for us today, as believers today, if we're going to do what God called, if we're going to fulfill the plan of God for our lives, God, ha we have to be willing to forsake that which is most comfortable and which is most familiar. That cycle has to be broken. It must be broken. Abram left the security of his family and be he began to walk by faith because there are some cycles God does not intend for us to repeat. Oh my goodness. There's some stuff we're dealing with God never intended for us to repeat it. The book of Ezekiel chapter 46 verse 9 says this. But when the people of the land shall come before the Lord in the solemn feast, he that entereth in by the way of the north gate to worship shall go out by the way of the south. And he that entereth in by the way of the south shall go out by the way of the north. He shall not return by the way of the gate whereby he came in, but shall go forth over against. In other words, Jesus is saying, you don't, come, you don't leave the same way you came. You don't go in the same cycle over and over again. You come in one way, you break that cycle and go out another way. You don't have to keep repeating the same thing over and over and over again. And, and because God says, don't do that, as long as you do that, I don't care what your worship is like, when you go out of the same door you came in, you haven't done anything. Worship should make a difference, and faith in God should make a difference in our lives. So you can't go out the same way you came in when you come to church. If you come to church happy, you ought to leave happier. If you come to church full of joy, you ought to be more joyful when you come to church. If you come to church mad, you ought to leave glad. Because you cannot go out the same way you came in, saith the word of God. Anybody understand what I'm talking about today? So faith and trust in God is the breaking agent that God uses to change a cycle in our lives. 
True faith in God is not what we say. True faith in God is how we seek him. Let me say that one again. True faith in God is not what we say, but it's how we seek him. If you're really walking by faith, that means you don't know where you're going and the only one who knows where you're going is God. And so if I'm truly walking by faith, I must seek after God in everything I do. I don't know where I'm going. He told Abram, as you go, I'll show you where you're going. If I'm truly born in walking in faith, I'm looking for God in everything I go through. Everywhere I go, I've got to find God. I've got to connect with God. I need to find him so I know where I'm going. Many of us are depending on what happened in the past, how smart we are, what we got going on. I'm depending on God because I'm walking by faith. When I walk by faith, that means I'm looking for God in everything. I do. Even at church, I'm trying to find God. Is God in the house? I need to connect with God. Is God in the praise and worship? Is God in the choir? Is God in the music? Is God in the offering? Is God beside me? I need to connect with God. I'm walking by faith. Praise and worship should not be a familiar experience. It should be an opportunity where we're finding, seeking, and searching for God. I shouldn't be looking at the people singing. I'm trying to find God. I want to connect with God in praise and worship. I'm walking by faith and not by sight. Is God in the offering? You see in the parking lot. You see with security. Every, every, every encounter I make, I'm trying to connect with him. Why? I'm walking by faith. I don't know where I'm going. You just told me you would show me as I start walking. So I'm like a blind man. I'm trying to find where you are so I can latch on hold to you and you can lead me where you want me to go. So I, I challenge us today, what is the Holy Spirit saying to you this morning? You see, see, too often we come to church because it's Sunday. I come to church to get something. I come to church because I want to connect on a different, on a higher level with God than I can at home by myself. You see, you see, you see, you see, the question becomes, what makes you so comfortable with you that you don't seek after God the way you ought to seek after him? Oh, my God. What is it about you that makes you so comfortable with you that God is not really the priority? Are you walking by faith? Jesus. Jeremiah 29, 12 and 13 tells us this. Then shall you call upon me and you shall go and pray unto me and I will hear you. I will listen to you. And you will seek me. And you'll find me when you search for me with all of your heart. Sitting in church, what else is going through your mind? What else is in your heart? Are you really seeking God? Are, are you really interested in connecting with God on a higher level? That's what it's all about. But God must break some cycles in our lives. Because we have memorialized some cycles. They're so holy, special, we have anointed them. Ooh, Jesus. But God breaks cycles by changing our...
part right there really intrigued me a lot. And God has to break our thinking and our behavior before he can change the cycle. Research, some research has been done at the Massachusetts General Hospital. They have a division called the Mind, Mood, and Memory Clinic. That was interesting as I read this. And this is what I found in doing this research. <clears throat> our mood is directly linked to our memory. Whoa. That made me stop. Our mood is directly linked to our memory. When we think happy thoughts, when we're happy, we have a good mood. When we think sad thoughts, we become sad and we have a bad mood. The Bible teaches us in Proverbs 23 and 7 that as a man thinketh in his heart, so is he. So, so, so my thinking and my mood are connected. Lord have mercy. Can I, can I continue? So then our emotions then serve as memory units. Our emotions kick off memories, and memories kick off emotions. And th th this is medical research now. We recall certain memories where similar emotions arise. Whatever emotion I have, I will recall a memory to that emotion. Wow. If I have a good memory about something, I'll have good mood and everything is fine. But if I have a bad memory about an experience in the past, that kicks in something else going on with my mood, my behavior, and my emotions. So if I meditate, on negative things, if I meditate on negative things, my mind will recall past bad experiences and they then reflect, my, my mood then will reflect what my mind is thinking about. Somebody catch this next week. My thoughts, my, my mood reflects what I'm thinking about, past bad experiences, and then those past bad experiences that I now remember puts me in a different mood and it starts a negative cycle going on in my life. And God wants to break the way we think. And he wants to, listen, all the experiences we had in the past, we just saw earlier, were lessons, not a sentence. They were just a lesson for us to learn. So I need to reflect on my past, learn a lesson, get into the word of God, and renew my mind so that my mood reflects the life of Jesus Christ. If I don't get into the word, my mood always goes back to a bad memory, and now that changes how I think. And even if something was good because I'm in a bad mood, thinking about a bad experience I had sometime in the past, even something good looks bad. Woo! God must break some cycles. The book of Colossians tells us this. Chapter 2, verse 8. Beware lest any man spoil you. Now we've read that and we thought the Bible's talking about, always talking about some man out there. He's talking about the man in here. 
Beware lest any man spoil you through philosophy and vain deceit. Endless arguments about stuff that really doesn't matter. After the tradition of, this is what men do, unsaved men do this. After the rudiments of this world and not after Christ. But I'm here to encourage some people today. Your day of reversal is here. Hallelujah. Your day of freedom is here. Your time for God to break that cycle is today. In the book of Ruth, chapter number one. And we'll be going home when I finish. We see some interesting things here. Verses one through six, please follow along with me. Now it came to pass in the days when the judges ruled that there was a famine in the land and a certain man of Bethlehem, Judah, went to sojourn in the country of Moab, he and his wife and his two sons. And the name of the man was Elimelech, and the name of his wife was Naomi, and the name of his two sons, Mahlon and Chilion, Ephrathites of Bethlehem, Judah, and they came into the country of Moab, and they dwelled there. And Amelech, Elimelech, excuse me, Elimelech, Naomi's husband, died. And he was left, and she was left, and her two sons. And they took them wives of the women of Moab. The name of one was Orpha, and the name of the other was Ruth. And they dwelled there about ten years. And Malon and Chilion, Chilion died, as both of them also. And the woman was left of her two sons and her husband. In other words, now her husband and her two sons had died. Then she arose with her daughters-in-law that she might return from the country of Moab, for she had heard in the country of Moab how that the Lord had visited his people and given them bread. Let's go back and we're going to close out with things here in Ruth. A man of God, his name was Elimelech, his wife Naomi and the two sons, are in Bethlehem. There is a famine in Bethlehem. Among God's people, a famine. God allowed a famine to occur. And so they left Bethlehem and moved to Moab to live. Because there was food in Moab. He could support his wife and family in Moab. While they're in Moab, the Bible says the man, the husband, the father dies. He dies. Leaving Naomi, a widow, with her two sons. Then her sons marry women from Moab, Orpha and Ruth. And they're happily married for 10 years. And wouldn't you know, an unexpected cycle occurs again. Her sons, both of them, die. You left a land of famine where people die. You go into a land of plenty where people survive. But now an, un an unexpected cycle has taken your husband and an unexpected cycle has taken your two sons. God, what is going on here? So she's left with her two daughter-in-laws. She talks to them and then she hears, she, she gets word while she's in Moab that in Bethlehem, God has visited the city, and there is bread to eat in Bethlehem. The famine is over. So she decides to go back to her home country, going to repeat a cycle. As she's about to go, she tells her two daughter-in-laws, you girls go back to your parents and go back to your own home countries and you serve your gods there because I, I, I'm going back to Bethlehem and, and, you, and they said no, 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 we're not going to go and, and, and she says well, you should go I'm too old to get married again and even if I did and got pregnant with more sons 
Will you wait for my boys, these young babies, to grow up so you can marry them again? She says it doesn't make sense. Go back to your people. Orpha kisses Naomi, and she leaves and goes back home. But Ruth looks at Naomi and says, oh, no, I ain't going nowhere. You know what, you know what Ruth is about to do? God is breaking a cycle in Ruth's life. See, God can take the unexpected and be glorified through it. Naomi and Ruth says, no, 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 mother-in-law. I'm not going back to my people. I'm going with you. Where you go, I'm going. And where you lodge and sleep, I'm going to sleep. Your people will be my people. And where you die and are buried, I'm going to die and, be, die and be buried there too. And your God will be my God. Wow. Sounds like Ruth is about to change a cycle. She'd already lost a husband through an unexpected cycle. But she's not going back to that situation because she, something about Ruth is telling her you cannot be used by God going back to what's familiar and comfortable. you got to be willing to walk by faith. So they go back to Bethlehem. And as they go into Bethlehem, people see Naomi. They see Ruth. And they're so happy to see Naomi. They say, oh, girl, don't you look good. We're so glad to see you. She said, don't call me Naomi. Call me Mara. I'm mad at God. God took my husband, took my two sons. I'm mad at, well, if you're so mad at God, why are you going back to eat his bread? You see, that's what we do as people. We get mad at God, but we still go back and want him to bless us. Bless me, Jesus. I need you to bless me, Lord. Just tell God anything. And while they're there, they get hungry and Naomi tells Ruth to go to the field and glean some corn. For those of you who don't, know, don't understand it, mean pick up the corn that's left that's been dropped. She's out picking up the corn. To fast forward a little bit, she picks up corn in the field of a noble man of God called Boaz. Boaz was a was the kinsman of Naomi's husband. So Boaz says to his, to his guards, let her go out and pick and glean with all she wants to. Let her do this. And so, so to fast forward, Ruth and Boaz hook up. They go on a date. They meet in a corner of the cornfield and talk. Not only do they date, start off the first date was in the cornfield, but they eventually get married. All Ruth wanted was a child. It's interesting that, that Boaz, who was older than Ruth, had been unmarried for a number of years. None of the ladies in Bethlehem thought he was good enough. He was not a bad dude. He was a good guy. So he was unmarried until he ran across Ruth. And this, this is where it really again begins to take off now. They have a son. And his name is Obed. And Ruth and Boaz are so happy because they got their first child. Obed is his name. They're happy for this baby. But Obed has a son, and his name is Jesse. Jesse has a son who was born in Bethlehem, and his name is David. David becomes the king. About a thousand years later, in the town of Bethlehem, through David, 
is born the king of kings. Oh my God. All Ruth born it was a baby, but God had a plan for a Messiah. God used a famine to bring about the birth of our Savior, our Lord Jesus Christ. Had it not been for the famine, they never would have left Bethlehem. Had no reason for Ruth to want to follow Naomi back to Bethlehem. Marry the right man who becomes all of in the line through which Jesus Christ is born. Oh my God. And so Jesus, some thousand years after David, identifies who he is through Calvary. King of kings and Lord of lords, the Lamb of God, who takes away the sins of the whole world. And the Bible tells us that he was, had such a powerful impact on the lives of people. And he was who God ordained from the very beginning, even when the famine occurred. The Bible says that God gave him a name that is above every name. That at the mention of the name Jesus, every knee shall bow, every tongue shall confess that he is Lord to the glory of God. That's what God had in mind. But wait. The Bible says in the book of Ephesians that before he ascended into heaven to sit down on the right hand of the throne of God, before he ascended, he first descended. When he descended, he went into the gates of hell, into Abraham's bosom, and preached the gospel to all the Old Testament saints in the bosom of Abraham. He ran across Abel and said, Abel, I am your excellent sacrifice. He went to Noah and said, Noah, I am the ark that you built. Oh, my God, my God, my God, my God. He went to Abraham and said, Abraham, I am the ram who was caught in the thickets. Oh, my goodness, my goodness. He went to Isaac and said, Isaac, I'm preaching to you, boy. I am the wells you dug. He went to Jacob and said, Jacob, wake up, boy. I'm the angel you wrestled with. Oh, my God. He went to Joseph and said, Joseph, I am your coat of many colors. He went to Moses and said, Moses, yay, Moses, yo, bro, I am your manna in the wilderness. He went to Aaron and said, Aaron, I am your great high priest. He went to Miriam and said, Miriam, I am the prophet that danced. Oh, my God. He went to Elijah and said, Elijah. I am the fire that came down from, he preaching, I am the fire that came down from heaven. He went to Elisha and said, Elisha, I am your double portion. Oh my God, my God, my God. He went to Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego and said, hey fellas, I am the fourth man you saw in the fire. Oh, hallelujah. Glory to God. And then he went to Ruth and said, oh Ruth. I'm so glad you let God change and break a cycle in your life. I know it was painful, but through the pain you suffered, you got power in your life. I'm here today because you obeyed God. It looked bad. It was a negative circumstance, negative cycle, but God. But God. What the devil planned for evil God, turn that thing around for your good. Somebody give the Lord a clap offering today. Yeah, Jesus. Oh, my God. And Jesus may have ended his sermon by saying, weeping may endure for a night. But if you stick with me, joy is coming in the morning. Give the Lord a clap offering if you would, please. Oh, my God. Thank you, Jesus. Oh, come on, magnify him today. Bless him. Bless him. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Come on, don't, don't stop. Bless him today. He's worthy of praise. 
He's worthy of glory. He's worthy of honor. Oh, thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. This is how we have victory over every unexpected cycle. True Jesus. Thank you for watching Praise Assembly Church Ministries with Dr. Johnny L. York. If you were blessed by today's message and would like a CD or DVD, email us at info at pacmchurch.org. Praise Assembly is a ministry where everyone is welcomed. Come join us for our Sunday worship services at 3254 Kernsville Road, Winston-Salem, North Carolina. For more information, visit our website at pacmchurch.org. See you next week at the same place and time. And remember, it's all about Jesus. Praise Assembly Church Ministries is more than a church. It's more than a place to go on Sundays. Yes, the word is great, the music is outstanding, and the people are nice, but it's more than that. Praise Assembly is a place where everyone is welcome, a place where everyone fits in, and prayer is at the foundation of everything we do. A life-changing church where you can become who God created you to be, where Jesus is the minister of the sanctuary, and people will love you just the way you are. At Praise Assembly, the doors are open, and we are ready to receive you.